My name is Dave Kuzanbeck. I'm a professor of civil and environmental engineering and director of our Steinbrenner Institute for Environmental Education and Research. We are pleased to co-host today's lecture along with the Office of the Vice Provost for Education. This uh, university lecture today is the uh, first of three lectures we will have throughout this year in our distinguished lecture series on environmental science, technology, and policy. And uh, the, the, the series is sponsored by the Steinbrenner Institute in partnership with the Office of Vice Provost for Education. The series this year has a theme, <coughs> Environment and Health. And our speaker today will uh, kick us off uh, looking at uh, some issues of water quality and health. The uh, series is also being, is part of uh, uh, a, a series of events being, uh, uh, that are part of Imperfect Health, a, uh, an exhibit going on, started this fall until February at the Miller Gallery uh, focus on the relationship of environment and health uh, from a number of different perspectives. So our event today is, is part of that. There's a brochure in the back about the, the series at the Miller Gallery. I encourage you to pick one up. Uh, Erica, where is the brochure? Okay. They're right on the landing before you go out. Right on the landing by the door before you go out. And in setting up the series, I'd like to acknowledge the help of Erica Ninos of the Steinbrenner Institute and Lisa Primo of the Office of Vice Provost for Education. Thanks so much. And with that, I'll introduce today's speaker. Today, we're pleased to welcome to Carnegie Mellon, Professor Kartik Chandran. Kartik is a professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Engineering at Columbia University, where he has been since 2005. And prior to that, uh, he worked, uh, he had several postdoctoral appointments, uh, one at the University of Connecticut, from which he uh, graduated in 1995. 1999. 1999. He's a young, young fellow. <laughs> 1999. Stayed there for a postdoc for a brief period. Then went to work uh, for a research, internal research group at Metcalf and Eddy. Uh, worldwide, a very famous environmental engineering uh, consulting firm. And he got a lot of great ideas there about the problems to be solved. And he'll be talking about some of those today, I think. Uh, did a second postdoctoral stint at Virginia Tech uh, with uh, Nancy Love, uh, Professor Nancy Love and Professor Peter Vixen, and uh, then joined Columbia. And uh, today he's going to be talking about a number of different projects and with the general theme of water quality and policy and health. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Richard Chandra. Thank you, Dave, for, for that kind of introduction. It's, uh, it's my first time in Carnegie Mellon. It's also my first time in Pittsburgh. Uh, and uh, well, I, I think apart from the weather, everything has been nearly perfect. Uh, so what I'm going to talk today uh, is about uh, rethinking water quality, uh, policies related to water quality, and, and environmental health and human health uh, in general. Uh, I've also added uh, this phrase, an elemental approach, because uh, I'm, I'm going to present to you some examples in terms of what we do today in order to improve water quality, uh, which, are, which is primarily, primarily driven by water quality regulations and policy, uh, and perhaps suggest uh, alternate ways to achieve similar, or if not even better, uh, water quality, environmental quality, uh, but with far less resources, money, and energy. So before I before I do that, before I do that, let's let's take a look at uh, the challenges that we face today as a society. Uh, so I, I think a lot of you, if not all of you, have seen something like this in one form or the other. So today, some of the primary challenges that we are faced with uh, deal with energy, with uh, with water quality, of course, with uh, with food, uh, also environmental pollution, uh, human health issues, disease. Uh, education, poverty, and uh, demographics. Demographics is not uh, very uh, intensely discussed or widely, uh, widely presented. I'm not going to focus on this uh, uh, 
today. But if there are questions, please, please do feel free to engage in some discussion. Uh, I would also like to mention that what I'm going to talk about today is at a fairly high level. But please do not uh, uh, hold back on any detailed questions. Almost uh, every section of what I'm going to be presenting today has uh, several layers of depth. So I'll be more than happy to, uh, to discuss uh, with you in some detail uh, to the extent that I know the answers. Anyway, so in, on top of these different problems, these different challenges rather that we are faced with today, one, one challenge that we are also faced with is the prospect that in the next uh, few decades, I think 70, up to 60 to 70 percent of the world's population is going to be living in major metropolitan centers. And we don't even know how these centers are going to look like. And I, I think perhaps this is a very good thing that we are not already biased by what, uh, what, what, what this looks like, and perhaps we can engineer and tailor better solutions. Now, the other, the other issue is that uh, this also constitutes a wicked problem. And, and by definition, a wicked problem cannot be solved in isolation. And I'll just take the example of uh, energy. I think we tried to, I think we, we tried to, to address in isolation the problem of energy a few years ago. Everybody was growing corn to produce ethanol and not to, uh, not to ser serve as the food source. And we did run into some problems there uh, with, re with respect to food prices going up. And uh, today what I'm going to focus on is uh, our approach to solve water quality and human health in isolation and in doing so, the, some of the mistakes that, we, that we've made. Ultimately, what I'd like you to all to take away is this is a problem that cannot be solved in isolation. It is much better perhaps to look at uh, to look at several problems in conjunction and perhaps even come up with uh, better solutions. Ultimately, I think uh, what I'd also like to highlight is the only way to achieving better quality and better environmental health is to stop talking about it and perhaps to focus on other, other issues and uh, by doing so perhaps have water quality and water become the bonus. And, uh, and, and this is what I'll present to you also uh, during this talk. So, OK, before we go into specific examples, let's take a look at how we, how we address, how we utilize, and what we do with our resources today. Let me start with, uh, let me start with water. The, the model for resource use for water is we mine water. And then we use water for different objectives. And then what do we do with the, the water? In essence, when we use water, we are actually enriching the water. Essentially, what we are doing is that we are adding from a very elemental perspective is that we are adding carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and a whole slew of other uh, elements to the water. And then what do we do with the water? In some, in, in, some, in some parts of the world where we have the resources to actually do something with the enriched water, what do we do with this? We put in even more resources, energy, and money into this to convert something that looks like this, sewage streams, back into, back into this water. So. Uh, Let's, let's, uh, let's keep this in mind. What do we do with food, for instance? What do we do with food and nutrients, for instance? We follow the same model. We grow crops. We enrich the soil, for instance. We are ultimately enriching the elemental composition because we are basically producing this from more, ele more, more simple uh, forms. We enrich and then discard. This is the same thing that we are doing with water as well. So ultimately, at least for these two uh, sectors, what we are doing is we are following the model of mining enriching, discarding. And in some parts of the world, instead of discarding, we put even more resources and then in an attempt, perhaps, uh, to, to go back to study, uh, to, to go back to, uh, to, to the beginning. Even though I don't have a slide for this here, we do the same thing with people, right? We enrich them, we educate them, and then uh, once, we, once, we, once there's this uh, so-called loss in functionality, let's say somebody who cannot run very fast or somebody who cannot uh, perhaps type as fast, the functionality is lost and what do we do? We discard the people. So it's the same model again and again and again. Uh, and this is something that, uh, that, that we really need to change. I will not focus on the people aspect, I'll only focus on nutrients and, and water today. Uh, so what results, as, uh, as, uh, what results uh, by virtue of all our activities? At least on the water side, this is what we have. We have sewage streams. Oh, uh, and sewage is not something which is, uh, which is uh, uh, common to the developing economies. It's all over the world. Uh, this, is a, this is a snapshot of the Long Island Sound. This is the state of Connecticut, New York, Long Island, and New York City is down here somewhere. And, and uh, primarily driven by nutrient discharges into the Long Island Sound, like clockwork, at the end of every summer, there are vast regions of the Sound which are completely anoxic. The way to read this, uh, this image is the darker the colors, 
the, less, the, the lower the dissolved oxygen concentration. And in, again, in some parts of the world, what we can do is that we can, we can re-engineer this whole system. We can, we can spend billions of dollars in, uh, in designing, redesigning, and, uh, and operating very advanced wastewater treatment plants, all designed to do something very good for the environmental uh, quality, let's say to improve the water quality and the health of the Long Island Sound. But mind you, this takes a lot of resources, a lot of energy, a lot of money. Just to put things in perspective, there are about 14 wastewater treatment plants in New York City. Uh, we process a total of about 1.2 billion gallons of wastewater per day. Uh, out of these 14 plants, five are required to remove nitrogen. And I was directly involved in the design of these five plants to remove nitrogen. Again, I, I would like to highlight remove nitrogen. This is what we are doing. And sure enough, we are spending a lot more energy on removing nitrogen for these five plants than we are for the other plants where we don't remove nitrogen. I'm not saying that we should not remove nitrogen. I'm not saying that we should not treat wastewater. But I'm, all I'm saying is perhaps recognizing that there are some, some uh, limitations here, all I'm saying is perhaps there is, there's a better way to do this. And uh, let's, let's try and see what these are. And so at least in, uh, at least in the US, uh, water quality is primarily governed by the Clean Water Act. There have been several amendments to, the, to this act uh, since when it was uh, originally proposed. The Clean Water Act, again, de uh, dictates the water quality of the nation. There are, uh, there are technology-based standards where, uh, where plants have to, wastewater treatment plants have to meet specific numbers in terms of their effluent uh, discharge goals. There are also water quality-based numbers which are more based on loading. New York City has a, has a bubble permit uh, which is more based on water quality than technology-based uh, standards and limits. So what, what, what are we governed by? And, and I would very much like to also point out that at least in the US, for the most part, we are not making a mistake in terms of policy. Ultimately, policy is, governed towards, is geared towards improving human health and environmental health. So I don't think we are making too much of a mistake there. The mistake that we are making is in our interpretation of the policies and in our way to actually meet the permits uh, that perhaps the Clean Water Act is mandating. So let's see what these permits are, what these permits were, and how they have, how they have uh, evolved. So uh, let's say, well, this is just a cartoon of a biological wastewater treatment plant. Uh, initially, let's say, let's say 75 years ago, uh, most of the influent uh, streams coming into the wastewater plants were domestic. And all that they contained were carbon in the oxidation state zero, average oxidation state zero. Uh, nitrogen in the average oxidation state minus three, amino acids. Ammonia, minus three oxidation state for nitrogen. And phosphorus, uh, plus five. And so wastewater treatment plants were primarily geared towards uh, uh, addressing these streams. And most of the regulations on the wastewater plants were related to the carbon side. Uh, and for those of you who have seen, who have seen wastewater treatment uh, or who have studied wastewater treatment, the kinetics of carbon removal to CO2, when I say removal, it's uh, by, by conversion to CO2, which can be stripped out, that's removal from the aqueous phase. Uh, the kinetics, especially under aerobic conditions, are relatively fast. And so what this means in terms of reactor sizing is that we can basically dig a ditch, line it with concrete, provide air, and we are done. So we have removed the carbon. And, and slowly, what uh, the realization was that it is not sufficient to remove carbon in many sensitive parts, uh, uh, in many parts of the country surrounded by sensitive water bodies. For instance, the Long Island Sound, the Chesapeake Bay, and some other regions. So then, what we have now are uh, regulations which not only focus on carbon, but on total nitrogen and total phosphorus. So just to give you a sense, the benefits of removing nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, in terms of water quality are at least an order of magnitude higher in terms of receiving uh, water quality than, than carbon. So you can get a lot more bang for your buck if you now start removing nitrogen and phosphorus in addition to the carbon. But that's not the only thing that changed. Over time, a lot of the influent streams coming into wastewater plants were, were not only domestic, but they were also industrial in nature, which meant that there were a lot of synthetic organic chemicals, heavy metals, and, and a whole slew of other compounds which were coming into these wastewater plants. And so imagine, imagine this from, from the point of, a, of an operator, from, a, from an engineer standpoint. You have the same wastewater plant. You've dug your ditch, you've lined it with concrete, you're providing some air, but now suddenly you have to start removing nitrogen. You have to start removing phosphorus, and then you're also faced with potential chemicals which are toxic to the bacteria in this, uh, in this reactor. 
So what, how do we respond? We start building bigger and bigger plants because, uh, well, let's say the kinetics of oxidation go down with, let's say, toxic chemicals coming in, you have to increase the size of the reactor. If you want to remove nitrogen, you have to provide five, up, up to five times the amount of air that you have to provide if you just want to remove carbon. Now, aeration is, uh, this is something that needs to be kept in mind. Aeration is not trivial. Uh, uh, the total volumetric capacity of, uh, of, the, of the aeration basins in New York City alone is about 400 million gallons. It's not trivial to provide air. You just don't put a pipe and put air through this. Uh, you have to spend a lot of energy getting the air through the diffusers to maximize oxygen transfer. And we, we have to do this to meet new regulations in response to, let's say, amendments to the Clean Water Act, which now dictated removal of very specific uh, uh, chemicals down to lower levels and lower levels with more reliability and predictability. So the policies, you know, the policies were not wrong. They are all geared towards improving human health and environmental health. But I, I think one of the biggest mistakes we made was to put, essentially what we did was we started putting more and more and more band-aids to the existing water infrastructure. That, that's what we have done today. And uh, I think therein lies uh, the possibility to improve. Let's take just a very, very brief look at the way we treat wastewater today in the developed world. So what we do is uh, primarily we, we, we take out the solids, the inerts, uh, primarily by uh, just gravity-based settling, mechanical settling, or even chemical enhanced uh, uh, pretreatment and precipitation. And then what we send on to the bioreactor are uh, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, some soluble, some insoluble. And the way we remove carbon and nitrogen is by uh, providing a lot of air. And then, uh, of course, uh, the bacteria use the substrates and make more cells. And then uh, we don't want to just get rid of all the cells, uh, so we settle them again and return them back to the bioreactor. And then uh, in some parts of the country, there is disinfection of the treated wastewater. In other parts, there is no disinfection. And basically, that's what we are doing. Uh, what we should recognize is that 60 to 70 percent of a wastewater treatment plant's overall energy footprint lies in providing air to this reactor. And what have we done in this reactor? From an elemental perspective, we have oxidized the carbon coming in, in, in the oxidation state zero to CO2. Uh, from an energy perspective, from a chemical perspective, uh, frankly, CO2 is useless. It's the most oxidized carbon compound. I, I'm not really sure how much we can, well, there are options, but there are a lot of other options as well. What have we done to the nitrogen? If all goes well, and if we are meeting permit, we have oxidized the ammonia to dinitrogen gas. And this is one of the worst things that we can do in terms of uh, elemental cycling. Let's take a step back. Let's forget about this for just a second. Let's see where the nitrogen is coming from. We fix nitrogen, atmospheric dinitrogen gas, to, to ammonia nitrogen. And uh, this is the Haber-Bosch process. Despite more than a century of its, uh, of its being implemented, it's still very energy intensive, very resource intensive. So this is what we are doing. Nitrogen gas to ammonia, a lot of energy. We grow crops, we consume the crops, we, we excrete ammonia, and that's what comes into the influent. What do we do here? We put in a lot of energy and hope that all the ammonia goes back to nitrogen gas. So what have we done here? We have maybe ended up at the same point, energy, energy, energy. So this, this probably, uh, right? I mean, the way this is presented, perhaps there are some, there, we have to do better, right? We are, we are scientists and engineers, we have to do better. We just can't do this. And this is where, I, this is what I, I, uh, this is what I'd like to per perhaps propose a better direction for changing the elemental cycling. What prevents us from reducing the carbon from zero to minus four? What do we get if we go from zero to minus four? We get methane. This is the least imaginative of all the options that we can, we can pursue. Methane is okay. If we know what to do with it, we can get energy. Why do we even need to take the ammonia back to dinitrogen gas? Why can't we just use the ammonia in, in the form that we are, that we are getting it here? Sure, there's some organic nitrogen as well, but why, why can't we just use the nitrogen in the same oxidation state directly for fertilizers? We, again, uh, these are all questions. Uh, frankly, I don't think we need to reuse all the nitrogen in, in, a, in a country like the United States because we are not lacking for fertilizers. But in other parts of the world where there are no resources to put centralized treatment plants, uh, this doesn't make any sense, especially when food security is, uh, is really at question here. So some of the solutions that I present today, we have to be somewhat intelligent about this uh, and, and in terms of where we, are, where we are implementing them. We'll, we'll get to that later. 
So let's talk about the nitrogen cycle and the way we re that we engineer the nitrogen cycle for, for wastewater treatment for nitrogen removal. So, and so this is the incentive. We don't want this to happen. So uh, of course, there are billions of dollars going in terms of capital and operating upgrades to wastewater plants all across the country. The Clean Water Act is going to clamp down more and more and more on, on more than just the coastal regions of the US. Wastewater plants across the US are now going to be uh, asked to remove nitrogen. This is, this is reality. This is, uh, this is happening. Consultants are very happy, by the way. And so, and so uh, what, is the, what, is the, what is the anthropogenic nitrogen cycle? I'm not going to talk about fixation. But uh, so we have nitrogen coming in in the minus 3 oxidation state. And to remove nitrogen, ultimately what we would like to do is go to dinitrogen gas, which is sparingly, uh, sparingly soluble and can be stripped out. So removal, again, is by virtue of converting something which is in the aqueous phase to something which is predominantly in the gaseous phase. Ammonia, ammonium, also there's a gas-liquid equilibrium. So, uh, so what do we do? We first rely on the process of nitrification, which is the aerobic oxidation of ammonia to nitrite and back to nitrate. If you look at the amount of oxygen which is needed for this oxidation, it is two moles of oxygen per mole of ammonia nitrogen oxidized to nitrate. And again, this is a huge... Uh, aeration load which needs to be imposed at a wastewater plant in addition to the air that we need for oxidizing the carbon. So this is on top of all of that. Have we removed any nitrogen by converting ammonia to nitrate? No. Ammonia, uh, nitrate is still aqueous and it's still a toxicant. Okay, how do we remove nitrogen? We, we, uh, we engage in the process of uh, denitrification. <coughs> We engage in the process of denitrification, which is then the conversion of uh, nitrate down to dinitrogen gas. And uh, for denitrification, what we have to do is we need to provide electron donors. Again, if you look at wastewater, wastewater composition across the US, uh, uh, there are very few places, there are very few influence streams where we do not have to add external carbon. And so for a city like New York, uh, the five plants, uh, the expenditure is about $15 million per year on methanol to, uh, to remove nit nitrate down to, uh, to very low acceptable levels. Again, uh, that's, that's what policy is telling us. We need to get down to this, this number. So what we have done is huge amounts of capital operating expenses, huge amount of uh, operating expenses. We are meeting the Clean Water Act permit, but, uh, but this is what we are doing. And uh, I think a lot of you can tell me right then, right here, well, this doesn't make any sense, right? Because we are going from ammonia to nitrite to nitrate, back to nitrite and then nitrogen gas. Why don't we just go from ammonia to nitrite and then come back down here, right? So this is, this. well, the answer is it's, it's, it's a bit more difficult than, uh, than doing this because imagine a 400 million gallon tank, you stop the process at nitrite and we know how to do this very well, uh, but it's an open tank, right? If you don't manage engineering parameters like the solids and the hydraulic retention times, nitrite oxidizing bacteria are going to colonize the reactor and just drive the process to nitrate. So uh, that, that's, that's a downside. Well, you could also ask the question, why not just go here? The answer is we can do this also. This is a process called anaerobic ammonia oxidation, Anamox. Some of you might, might know this. Anaerobic ammonia oxidation was first detected uh, in, in reactors in, uh, in the Netherlands in the, in the mid-90s. Uh, there are about 20 full-scale Anamox plants in, in Europe, uh, many more uh, in Asia. How many Anamox plants are there in the U.S. today? Does anybody know? I guess zero. Uh, absolutely correct. There are zero Anamox plants. <laughs> I didn't know it. There are indeed zero Anamox plants in the U.S. today. Uh, you know, anaerobic ammonia oxidation saves 62.5% uh, of the air and 100% of the carbon. Why haven't we, why, why cannot we harness uh, this, uh, this, this unique uh, set of bacteria and metabolic pathways? Uh, well, I, I think it's, it has something to do with perception and the slow kinetics and the, uh, and primarily the slow kinetics. But uh, we are changing this. My group is actually involved all over the country actually uh, putting in place the first full-scale Anamox plants uh, around the country. There, there's going to be one in New York City, Washington DC, Virginia, and there are other designs which have already gone into place. And we work with each one of these, uh, these utilities trying to put Anamox, but, but in any case. But that's still nitrogen removal, it's not recovery. Okay, so, uh, 
So from a, from a microbial ecology side, from a fundamental microbial metabolism uh, side, this is a f the nitrogen cycle is just very, very fascinating. I think uh, uh, maybe some of you know this. Uh, my group primarily focuses on the nitrogen cycle, but also the connections of the nitrogen cycle to the carbon, water, and energy cycles. So even though I presented to you a very simplistic figure in the last slide, this is how the engineered nitrogen cycle actually looks like, because everybody is everywhere, everybody is uh, transforming the nitrogen, and it's not, this is what is reality. So you, we have, we have ammonia oxidizing bacteria, nitride oxidizing bacteria, but then there is competition for nitride. There are denitrophars uh, taking this all the way down to N2. Uh, there are also, nit uh, there's also nitride oxidation by, uh, sorry, there's also nitride reduction by ammonia oxidizing bacteria to nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas 300 times as uh, potent as uh, carbon dioxide from a 150 year time frame. What else can go on? There's also anaerobic ammonia oxidation, which can cycle nitrogen. Uh, there are ammonia oxidizing archaea in these systems, which can cycle the nitrogen. There's just, uh, this is very exciting. The more the arrows, the more the colors, the more exciting. Uh, what we do is, what we do is we, we look at uh, the community ecology in a very quantitative sense. We, we look at uh, uh, fingerprints in terms of who's there, but also, uh, what are they doing? What language are they speaking? And this is very important because when we engineer the nitrogen cycle, we are not just talking about an oxidation ditch. We are talking about imposing environments like anoxic, anaerobic, aerobic environments, and we need to know exactly what reactions are being catalyzed. But this is uh, still removal. We are having fun, but this is all still removal. Uh, and anyway, if you, if you, if you would like to take a look at uh, some of the work that we have done on the engineered nitrogen cycle, I'll, I'll there are some references here. Uh, let's look at what we do with phosphorus. Uh, fortunately, we do not, we do not re redox cycle the phosphorus. And uh, biological phosphorus removal essentially comes down to two reactors in series, anaerobic followed by aerobic. I don't expect you to read all of this, but what I'll, just sum what I'll do is summarize. In the an and this is a very specific sequence, anaerobic followed by aerobic. Uh, if there are volatile fatty acids, uh, where do they come from? I'll tell you later. But if there are volatile fatty acids in the influent to the anaerobic reactor, uh, there are some specialized bacteria that we, that we collectively term phosphorus accumulating organisms or PAOs. Uh, the PAOs can uh, actually take up the carbon and convert the carbon into uh, polyhydroxyalkanoic acids. So th these are just long chain polymers of uh, carboxylic acids. Can be when, when the carbon skeleton is four carbons, this is polyhydroxy beta butyric acid, but doesn't have to be just butyric acid, can be any carboxylic acid. So in the anaerobic reactor, this is what is happening, and there is some release of phosphorus. And then when the, when the organisms are taken to the aerobic uh, reactor, they utilize the internal, internally stored uh, PHB reserves, and they take up a lot more phosphorus than they initially released. So this is called luxury uptake of phosphorus, and this is how we remove phosphorus. Here we are not converting phosphorus into gaseous phosphorus. Uh, what we are doing is we are enriching for organisms that can take up phosphorus in far higher quantities than stoichiometrically predicted by the empirical cell formula. How do we remove the phosphorus from the liquid phase? By converting this to the solid phase. And uh, this is how phosphorus removal is practiced. But again, look at the system. We need fatty acids to drive this. We need energy on the aeration side. So, Nitrogen and phosphorus removal is mandated by water policies, by water quality limits, and, the, and we have figured out a way to address those policies. What I'm trying to say here is perhaps, while the policy is correct, the way we have been interpreting them and addressing them perhaps not, not as good. So where is, this, where is this taking us? You know, water quality limits are going to come down. There is no other direction in which the limits are going, and more and more plants have to, me have to, have to meet these permits. And again, there was a study done recently by the Water Environment Research Foundation through the, through the Nutrient Challenge and the Optimization Challenge. Uh, and again, what I show here on the y-axis is the energy utilization and the, and the CO2 emissions as a function of increasing degrees of treatment. So level one could be just very elementary physical chemical uh, removal of carbon, not, not biological, no aeration. And then level five could be very advanced degrees of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus removal by employing nitrification, denitrification, and biological phosphorus removal. And, and you see something which is not that surprising. So the cleaner the water, the higher the energy demand. Not, not, not too many surprises here. 
if we do things, if we, if, if, if we go about doing our business uh, uh, according to what we know today, this is what we are going to end up with. And, and as the water quality limits come clamping down, we are going to spend more and more and more energy. Today, the wastewater industry spends about 6% of the energy that we consume as a country. This is still out of reach for about 80% of the world's population. About 4.5 billion people on the planet today, they cannot do this. They cannot even come close to these levels of treatment in big centralized uh, treatment facilities. In this country also, at, at some point, we need to recognize that we are hitting an asymptote. We, we just cannot keep going in this, uh, in this direction. What do we do as scientists and engineers? If we, are, if we are faced with the prospect of hitting a wall and diminishing returns, we just don't keep blindly going in this direction. What we can do is change the axis, for instance. Now, I'm going to give you two examples, one here and one later on. This is a plant in uh, Strass, Austria. All that this plant did was uh, they started anaerobically processing the carbon. Very straightforward. They started anaerobically converting the carbon to methane gas. They also did something else. They started importing carbon from other sources and converting that also into methane. And in doing so, they started producing energy. These are the dark, these are the magenta bars here. They started producing energy and in about four years became completely energy positive. All that they did was uh, look at the carbon and just <coughs> converting the carbon to methane. They did not change the way that they were doing nitrogen, uh, removing nitrogen or phosphorus, just the carbon. So this, this gives us one example. If you, are, if you are faced with the prospect of going in this direction, let's change the axis, let's change something. Let's stop aerobically treating the carbon and maybe recovering the methane for use as energy. So this is just one example. What are the other potential uh, 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 sources of energy? What are the potential other endpoints as well? So at, at the influence side, we can get chemicals. Uh, when, when I say, I, I think we should really stop using the word wastewater. To me, this is just enriched water. This is enriched in carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. You know, a lot of the chemicals that we, that we make today, that we use today, are derived from fossil carbon. So we have to travel a long way in terms of electrons and oxidation states to bring them to uh, a compound in the form that we can use today. Plastics, chemicals, fuels, right? This is a long gap. You look at enriched water, you have to move one step. And you have also uh, obtained uh, perhaps some reasonably clean, uh, uh, clean water as well. So we can, we can make chemicals, we can make energy from, uh, from, these, from these influence streams. Uh, not every influence stream, by the way. Uh, we, can, we can discuss this. We can make chemicals and energy at this process, at the bioreactor level. At the effluent, at the very least, we can capture the flow energy. This is also being practiced in some places. What, what do we do with the solids? We can again make chemicals and energy. So let's be a bit more specific. Uh, and before we do that, you know, when we start talking about energy, chemicals, and recovering resources, what have we done? We've stopped talking about water quality. Water is the bonus here. Okay, so now what could a wastewater treatment plant, or let's say now a biorefinery, what could this look, uh, what could this look like? Again, elemental composition, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus. So this is what is uh, coming in, and uh, I'm presenting this in a very specific sequence, uh, and I can, I can go with the reasons for doing this later on. So what we could potentially do is anaerobically convert the carbon first, the kinetics of anaerobic con uh, conversion of carbon are still much higher than, uh, than some of these downstream processes. So again, what do we need to do? Build a small reactor. Do not aerate it, just mix it, and, uh, and, uh, and we can get anaerobic conversion of carbon, let's say to methane or other, or other chemicals as well. What do we have left for the most part? Nitrogen and phosphorus. Now phosphorus is possibly going to be easier to precipitate out uh, upstream. And then what do we have left? We have nitrogen. Depending where we are, we can either do uh, recovery of nitrogen, biologically or chemically, or we can, we can invest in nitrogen removal. But if we have to do nitrogen removal, we need to do this anaerobically. We just cannot uh, be, be, be using aerobic uh, processes. So how have we changed the elemental cycling of, uh, of these so-called waste streams? Carbon is now being reduced. Instead of going from C0 to plus 4, we are going from C0 to minus four, and maybe even stopping before. There are some other chemicals that we can get back. Nitrogen, there is no redox cycling uh, if we go to recovery. So N stays in the minus three oxidation state, and phosphorus, we don't change 
It's, uh, we don't change the redox state. So the challenge here is, I mean, we have technologies. We can put boxes. Today we can put these boxes. We know how to do this. The challenge is, where do we do this? Uh, how do we monetize the recovery? And how do we do this in a reliable fashion? Uh, and these are all very important questions that we need to, that we need to address. And so just to give you an example uh, of the broad spectrum of chemicals, at least, that we, can, uh, that we can get back, and also fuels that we can get back, we can produce biofuels. We can produce precursors to soil. Uh, we can produce commercial chemicals, bioplastics. Uh, uh, this I'll touch on. Fertilizers. And we can also produce electricity, depending on the, depending on the feedstock uh, that, we are, that we are looking at. So let's, let's look at some, some specific examples now. So I'll first talk about carbon and then go to nitrogen and phosphorus. So for the carbon side, I think it's, uh, what we can do is something that we already do in many parts of, uh, in many wastewater plants, sometimes even without our knowledge. So anaerobic co a co a conversion of carbon, let's say just to, just to methane, just to a mixture of methane, carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide and moisture and water, and then uh, and then what we are left with is nitrogen and phosphorus. You know, the process of anaerobic digestion is, 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 is great. Uh, sorry to use a very qualitative term, because during anaerobic digestion, it's just the carbon which is getting reduced. The nitrogen and phosphorus during anaerobic con conditions don't get touched. They are not oxidized, they are not reduced. Nitrogen stays in minus three state, phosphorus stays. So depending where we are, we can, we can recover this as well. Or I can tell you another way to take the methane and then use the methane to remove the nitrogen uh, if needed. And that, that's coming up. So this is different uh, from what we are doing today. In, in most parts of the country today, sure, we are anaerobically digesting sludge, not sewage, but sludge. We produce methane. But then what do we do with the digester gas? We flare the digester gas. Can you, can you actually burn digester gas? You can't burn digester gas. There's enough moisture in there. So you have to actually buy pure methane, co-inject it, and then burn it. So we are literally burning money. OK, then what do we do to remove the nitrogen? We spend $15 million on buying methanol. So we can, we can surely do this better. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, so this is one of the first projects I worked uh, on as a consultant. Uh, these are real tanks, actually, in the 26 watt plant in Brooklyn, uh, where we were taking sludge. We were uh, not digesting it to take it all the way to methane, but we were stopping short of methane. And uh, we were producing uh, short chain volatile fatty acids, acetic acid, propionic acid, butyric acid, C2, C3, C4. And what were we doing with the, those, uh, those VFA? We were using them for denitrification to remove the nitrogen. And we found out, and this has been confirmed in many, many other studies, that the kinetics of denitrification on, on volatile fatty acids is, is, is much higher than the kinetics of denitrification on methanol. So we have generated an internal carbon source, and this is much more efficient than methanol that, that we've been purchasing. And uh, we've, we've, we, we after that, we also used uh, fermentation to, uh, to, to process uh, not only sludge, but also uh, a so-called nuisance uh, stream that results on the top of bioreactors and digesters, which is uh, which is surface, uh, surface foam. But carbon is carbon, fermentation is fermentation. We can, we can produce VFA from just, from just about anything. It's, it's the reactor design and understanding the pathways that actually, that actually matters. So this was carbon recovery, but we tied this to nitrogen removal. Removal because this is, these are the permits, this is how we meet the permits today. We can change this later on. Uh, we are also engaged in a project where we convert, we don't go to methanol, we don't go to VFA, well, uh, we, we go to more lucrative products like uh, biodiesel. You know, the carbon, again, we can dig deeper. Carbon is not all the same, even though I just said that. Uh, carbon is carbohydrates. Uh, uh, there, are, there are lipids. And, uh, and uh, for, the, for the most part, we are focusing, we are focusing on, the, on, the, on the lipids. So carbohydrates, lipids, and amino acids. Here we are focusing on the lipids. What can you do with lipids? You can make biodiesel. Uh, and then if we, can, if we can find a way to internally produce the methanol, we can feed that methanol for biodiesel production as well. This is not Star Trek, this is not science fiction. I, I'm actually doing this in Africa right now. Not in the US, in Africa. So what can we do with phosphorus? Remember we, we went through this uh, anaerobic aerobic sequence? What can we do with this carbon which is stored inside the cell? Now it just so happens that uh, we can make, uh, these are precursors for bioplastics. So polyhydroxy, polyhydroxy 
uh, alkanoic acids can be converted into bioplastics. And so instead of removing phosphorus, keep the phosphorus, feed the volatile fatty acids. Where do we get the volatile fatty acids? From sludge that we can produce VFA and take those VFA to, 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 to bioplastics. This is not trivial. Uh, to extract the PHB out of the cell requires energy. So that balance has to be done. It may never come out to be positive, but at least we are recovering something. Okay, now how do we get methanol? Now this is, uh, this is, the, this is uh, one project that, I, that I'm also involved in. This is funded by the, the Water Environment Research Foundation Paul Bush Award two years ago. Uh, the objective is to convert uh, digester gas into methanol. Now digester gas on a good day is about 40 to 50 percent methane. It also has CO2, it has hydrogen sulfide, it has moisture. You try to chemically convert digester gas into methanol, the catalyst, the chemical catalyst will probably foul up quite rapidly and chemical catalysts are quite expensive. On the other hand, and it's also very difficult to break the CH bond in methane to go to methanol. On the other hand, we know that there are bacteria that do this for a living. Uh, these are called methane oxidizing bacteria. They make, they make CO2 from methane and they make more cells. This is how they live. Do we want to go from methane to CO2? No, we don't want to do that. We want to go from methane to methanol. Now, so this is why now what we are doing is we are using relatives of methane oxidizing bacteria. These are ammonia oxidizing bacteria, but they have one specific enzyme, ammonia monooxygenase, which oxidizes typically ammonia to nitrite. This is how they get uh, energy for, 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 for biosynthesis, but due to its evolutionary history, it can also oxidize methane to methanol. Now let's look at the other uh, uh, compounds in the stream. Moisture, well bacteria don't care about moisture, they actually like moisture. CO2, well ammonia oxidizing bacteria are autotrophic in nature, so they love CO2. Hydrogen sulfide is an issue, I admit that. And, uh, but what we are doing here is, we are not solving one problem again. We are not solving ammonia to nitrite alone, we are converting ammonia to nitrite for sure and methane to methanol as well using the same organism. So again, two, two challenges in the, same, uh, in the same reactor. What do we get? We get a mixture of nitrite or nitrate and methanol. Can we do something with this? You just switch off the air, you let the denitrifying bacteria take over. You've not bought $15 million worth of methanol, you're making the methanol from internally generated carbon sources. So again, this is not, this will never be 100% offset, but at least there is, there is some recovery, there's some recovery going on. So here, this is what I call solving multiple challenges, but also from a fundamental perspective, we have combined now the carbon and nitrogen metaboli uh, metabolisms in this, in, this very, in this very neat organism. Again, more detail, I'll be happy to address questions on, on the detail mechanistics also. So, and the, these are not the only compounds. If you take a look at this list, uh, there are some things that should jump out at you. The platform technology for producing all of these compounds is fermentation. How do we do fermentation? You just load a reactor and, and just watch it go sour. Uh, and if, if, if your digester doesn't do very well, it is a fermenter. I, I think this is a bit oversimplified, but I think, this is, I, I think it captures this to an extent. And if you, if you look at the other column here, this is all price per gallon, by the way. So gasoline is not even close. And uh, if you look at uh, succinic acid has been described by the DOE to be one of the top bio-based chemicals. But so far, we've been running uh, after other feedstocks to produce succinic acid, whereas we have this enriched, enriched water that we can make succinic acid from. This is not trivial again. If we want succinic acid for use as a nutraceutical, we need to put energy, we need to put money in to purifying and extracting, so this is not trivial. But in some cases, with methanol, we don't need to purify. But uh, with VFA, we don't need to pur purify. So again, we need to be intelligent in terms of what we produce, where we produce, and how this can be monetized. And uh, let's now take a quick look at chemical uh, phosphorus recovery. Uh, what we are doing, this is already happening in plants. Uh, this is based on precipitation of this compound struvite, which is basically a precipitate of, uh, of magnesium, uh, ammonia, and phosphate. This is what a, a pipe in a, in a wastewater treatment plant looks like uh, with struvite precipitation. The pipes get clogged. So this is a nuisance. But we can take another look at it. This is fertilizer. And so now what we are trying to promote is controlled precipitation of struvite to produce uh, fertilizer. Again, uh, one of the most uh, one of the more widely known processes for, for producing uh, phosphorus fertilizer is Ostara. There are other variants as well uh, which, are, which are out there. And this is being conducted in plants uh, 
in several plants in North America and, and Europe also, not under Ostara though. And uh, nitrogen recovery is fairly exciting. Biological nitrogen recovery is even more exciting because this again deals with short-circuiting some of those pathways and taking part of the ammonium to nitrite and then all of that nitrite to nitrate. Uh, this is only valid for, uh, for high-strength nitrogen streams. Where do we get these streams? We get them from the bottom of the digester. Where do we get these streams? We also, in some parts of the world where there are urine separation toilets, we get, that, we get the stream from the separated urine as well. So we don't have to look at the wastewater alone. There are other streams where this can be managed as well. So I, I think that, uh, so I'm not, I'm not done yet, by the way, but I'd like to, this is somewhat of a segue here. Uh, so one way to address water quality, environmental health, and perhaps go back to policy and, 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 and uh, take another look is by trying, by, trying by, by realizing that these problems cannot be solved in isolation. We really have to start solving problems in conjunction. Okay, now that, that leads me to the, perhaps the concluding section of my talk here. So far, I mean, what we see in the developed world are these massive uh, centralized uh, wastewater treatment systems. And uh, really this is, not, this is not even feasible in, uh, to serve, if you look at the water quality and load, water load, this is not possible to serve 80% of the world's population. So with anaerobic treatment process, anaerobic processes, recovery processes, uh, with high strength wastes, uh, what, what we can also conceptualize is we can, the, these processes are very adaptable to decentralized uh, systems because uh, well, let, let me perhaps lead you through one, one uh, channel of thought here. How much water do we all drink per day, on average? Just a ballpark is enough. You drink or use? Drink. Two liters. Two liters, fine, fine. How much water, uh, on average, do we consume per person per day in the US? 250 gallons. Uh, we, do, we do better than this, 100 gallons per person per day. Really? Yes, on average, average. That's not the figures I know because in Sweden they went from uh, 200 down to 160 and they thought that was an advance and they are more advanced than we are. So I think that number is underestimated. Liters or gallons? Liters or gallons. Liters. Liters. So we are talking gallons here. Oh, 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 okay. So, uh, okay, but, but in any case, the, I, I think this was just an illustration. No, no, so in, in 100 liters, uh, 160 liters per person, it, Europe is typical. But you're saying how many gallons per person? 100, 100 gallons, gallons in, the, in the US. That's 360 liters per person. It's about 387 uh, yeah. liters per person per day. Yeah. But I think the, the illustration is more, we are drinking two liters, right? We're drinking half a, li half a gallon per day, and we are consuming 100 gallons. So essentially what we have done is we are using water as a conveyance mechanism for all the pollutants. And we really don't have to do this. And uh, one of the things that we also do is we combine the liquid waste and the human waste and use more, 99 times more water to carry this. And again, this, this doesn't need to be done. Uh, we cannot, uh, so, so one thing that can be done is separate the human waste and don't use water as a conveyance mechanism to, to channel the waste. And uh, this cannot be done uh, in some parts of the country where there's not enough of a load to support this. But think about a big city like this, a multi-story dwelling, a dorm, an engineering building, this can very well be done. We can, if we separate uh, uh, the liquid and the solid part of the human waste, we have concentrated streams. Anaerobic processes work much, much better with concentrated streams uh, uh, and, 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 and at higher temperature. So this is already being done uh, to an extent. This is Battery Park City in downtown Manhattan. There's water reuse being practiced in the basement. What we have added at Columbia is the dimension of resource recovery, not only in terms of water, but in terms of recovering the carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So what we do today is that we take uh, uh, food waste from the cafeteria and subject it to just fermentation in, uh, in, in the engineering building. So this becomes a very good model for decentralized recovery. What do we do with this? Uh, we actually grow crops for some part of the year when this is still possible in New York. So now we are talking Manhattan, we are talking urban agriculture. Remember the model? In a, in a city with a productive core, when things stop functioning, we just send them out. Imagine how the, it, it costs a lot of resources and money shipping in food into these big cities. Whereas here, what we are doing is we are, we are, growing, uh, we are growing crops in uh, very, much, very much in a city. So there's, uh, we are recovering resources, but then there's also the connection to food. We all know about the 
the, the proposed nexus water, energy, food, well, this is, this is how we can, we can address some of this, by the way. So anaerobic fermentation, going to fertilizers, and then uh, producing crops. And again, we are not the only people doing this. This is also being practiced on a much larger scale in Chicago. The city of New York has also bought out some derelict, derelict buildings in Brooklyn, and this is uh, uh, to, to, conduct, to carry out urban agriculture. We talk about green jobs. This is, this is one example right here, which is close to our industry. Uh, policy, how does resource recovery and how do these connect? Uh, well, uh, so far the link has been somewhat nebulous, uh, but there's also, I'd like to highlight the example of a very forward-thinking utility in the U.S. This is East Bay Municipal Utility District near San Francisco. And what they do have now is a resource recovery permit. And they, of course, they process their own carbon, but they also take up all these additional waste, waste streams. And this is one of the few utilities in the country which is resource and energy positive. And they're actually putting the power back on the grid and actually selling, selling energy as well. But uh, one thing to be taken into account is they cannot do this except if they start importing carbon. So that this, this is something that needs to be done. Uh, we have to, again, take into account the stoichiometry, C, N, and P, and uh, then make a decision whether we need to import carbon or not. And again, what, what East Bay Mud is doing is only addressing the carbon. They also have a very interesting project in terms of converting fats, oils, and grease brown grease into biodiesel. So I, I would also like to go far, uh, this far and say, if you are dealing with fats, oils, and grease, for God's sakes, don't digest this. Make biodiesel out of the, out of the lipids uh, in, uh, in the stream. The only things that you need to digest are the carbohydrates, the sugars, and the amino acids. So uh, well, this is all in the developed world. We are also working uh, to a fair extent in, uh, in, some, in, in developing countries, what we are doing there is we are putting source separation toilets, designing them in the US, implementing them in several villages in Africa, and we are also teaching them, teaching students there how to design and implement these toilets. The source separation toilets basically separate the human uh, liquid waste, which is enriched in nitrogen and phosphorus, and in a healthy individual should be nearly sterile. So you don't need additional disinfection for the urine. What do we do with the solid waste? This is a different issue. Uh, what do we do with the solid waste? Here, this is my plant in uh, plant about four hours north of Accra in Ghana. We are building this uh, series of reactors, fermentation followed by digestion, to recover the fatty acids, uh, to recover methane, and to also, also get, uh, get other compounds. And finally, on the nitrogen side, you know, I, I perhaps illustrated to you how how wasteful we are in terms of engineering the nitrogen cycle. We also published last year in terms of re-engineering the nitrogen cycle, a uh, lot of work on nitrous oxide. And essentially what, what we have shown is that uh, if we, either we have to do remarkably in terms of nitrogen removal, or we don't touch the nitrogen at all. And if we do one of these two things, uh, we also generate a lot less N2O. Ultimately, when we are able to trade nitrous oxide on the, on the let's say, the Chicago Climate Exchange, uh, there's the prospect also to return a lot of the capital made into developing more and more technologies. Treatment, removal technologies, perhaps not. Recovery technologies, perhaps. And so finally, what I'd like to say, after all of this time, I'd, I'd, of course, I'd like to qualify this by saying resource recovery is not the, not the end-all solution. We have to be very clever about, about implementing this. So I have taken the liberty of dividing the world into uh, three categories. Developed, not as developed, and developing. Uh, this is just the theme. So let's see what characterizes or what typifies a developed economy. There is food security. Uh, not much questions on food security. Good technology and engineering. Now let's answer the questions, how do we uh, what do we do with the three elements, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus? For phosphorus, the answer is always recover the phosphorus. Phosphorus is a limited reserve. We are going to run out of phosphorus, or accessible reserves. Uh, what do we do with nitrogen here? Perhaps not recover. It's OK to remove the nitrogen. What do we do with the carbon? And I, I, I specifically point to carbon to get chemicals or energy, because this is the technologically the most challenging. But we have the technology and engineering background, so we can recover the carbon and, and phosphorus, nitrogen, perhaps not as much. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum. What do we have here? We have big questions on food security. Technology and engineering education, perhaps not the, not the, the strong point. Do we, what do we do with phosphorus? The answer is the same. Always recover the phosphorus. What do we do with the nitrogen? Let's go ahead and recover the nitrogen here, because this will ultimately boost 
uh, food production and, 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 and crop yields. Do we have to recover the carbon to produce energy? Perhaps not at this point. Uh, we can look uh, perhaps down the line here. Let's look at the middle of the spectrum here with the, let's say, the so-called BRICS now, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa also. So there are some questions on food security, not as bad, not as good, uh, but there's a lot of good technology and engineering education. The backbone is there. Do we, well, we know what to do with phosphorus. We should probably recover the nitrogen to improve food security, but here we can actually do all three. Let's go ahead and touch the carbon as well and, and recover the carbon also. Okay, so I think this is one of my final slides. I think this has been, uh, this has been a, uh, somewhat of a long journey here, but what are we limited by? You know, I, I think one of the main limitations that we are faced with is when I say, when, when I mention the word city, this is what we come up with, a central core uh, surrounded by, this is Jersey, by the way, but sorry, nothing against Jersey. Uh, and, and then this is probably a city of the future. But this, this is what comes to mind. And uh, the more we, we, well, the longer we stick to this model, I think we'll continue to make the mistakes that we are making today. This is a wastewater treatment plant in Accra. Uh, this is a U an upflow anaerobic sludge blanket reactor in Accra, Ghana. Uh, very well designed. Zero liters of flow going into this plant because uh, the truck drivers have decided that instead of coming and dumping their uh, sludge here, they can just dump it in the ocean. It's quicker. They don't get stuck in a traffic jam. They get paid by the truck, so it seemingly works. Uh, so this is a very good example of putting a centralized uh, piece of uh, equipment, infrastructure in a, in a place where this will not work. Why? Because we thought that we would be governed by regulations in, in Africa uh, to the extent and the same regulations that we are governed by over here. So this completely has to change. We just cannot impose technologies and regulations and policy for 90% of the world's population uh, thinking that this is going to work. This is just not going to work. Uh, and so there have to be changes in technology, in, uh, in, in, in planning, in architecture, but also policy. Finally, I teach wastewater treatment at Columbia, and uh, nowadays I apologize at the end of the semester because I teach removal and not recovery. This also needs to change, by the way. That's all I have. Uh, I think after slide 14 or 15, I stopped talking about water, right? We've been talking about recovery, so water is the bonus. <laughs>